Podcast Podcast, a podcast about podcasting from True Story FM. I'm Pete Wright, and that right there is Andy Nelson. Hi, everybody. How are you feeling about podcasting? How's your podcast mood? It's positive. That's good, because the rest of the industry is looking up, too. I don't know if you remember, not long ago, like, really measured in months, <laughs> the uh, the general tone of podcast industry headlines was less than positive. In fact, it was, what is podcasting even doing? Uh, people should probably just give up and go back to banking. I may be made up banking. <laughs> well, but I think that's true. I think there was this, this issue with the way that Apple was... Uh, changed how it calculated uh, listenership and downloads yes. that affected a bunch of things. Advertisers like publishers were restructuring. Advertisers were like, well, this isn't really doing as much. And so like all of this sort of stuff changed, like podcast companies started uh, laying people off. And so it was going through all of these changes and it wasn't feeling good for a while. That is really, really true. And I think the, uh, you know, coming off of the pandemic too, the pandemic was a major reset in podcasting. Everybody started a podcast. There was a massive uh, influx in new podcasters into the industry. And then they went back to work. And so we had massive numbers of podcasts that appeared to have just died. And that changed uh, a, a lot of the sort of executive advertising impression of what podcasting represented. And over the last couple of years, we have seen that reset again. And it, we're back to a, a bit of a more, I think, rational approach to what podcasting is. Um, there was the notable slump that happened in those years, the pandemic and immediate post-pandemic. But Bloomberg reports that uh, it is rebounding officially in 2024. Podcast executive optimism has returned as the market begins to expand again after this long contraction. Um, they didn't give us a lot of quantitative data, but uh, this uh, we have this article from Neiman Journalism Lab that says uh, that's talking about how more people than ever are now listening to podcasts. And they are discussing their findings on the annual Infinite Dial survey, which shows that growth in podcast listening despite recent challenges in the industry, and I'll say that phrase is carrying a lot of water, uh, is, <laughs> uh, lets us know that more Americans than ever are listening to podcasts and listening to them regularly than ever before. The survey uh, from Edison Research says 67% of people in the U.S. 12 and old, older have listened to a podcast, 47% listened in the last month, 34% in the last week. What did those numbers indicate for you? It's an interesting set of numbers because, uh, I mean, it's great that so many people have listened to a podcast. You want to see those other numbers, uh, like listening in the last month. I mean, almost half of the people in the U.S. have listened to a podcast in the last month, which is great, right? 34% mm -hmm. in the last week. Okay, so that means not as many people are listening weekly, like weekly regularly, but you still have almost half of Americans listening at least once a month, which is uh, which is a great place to be, you know, just this. And it's been this steady growth mm -hmm. lately, which is nice to see that we're we're moving in a direction where more and more people are trying it out and finding the apps less technically threatening and are willing to give it a try. And I think that's that's uh, for some people, I think that's kind of been the the block of keeping them from entering it. But once you kind of figure it out, it becomes easy. And it's like, oh, well, why don't I listen to this on my commutes? Yeah, right. To me, I see that 34%. And I think, look at all that headroom, right? Look at yeah, all right. that incredible headroom of people who haven't discovered your podcast yet. And I find that enormously exciting, really exciting for our industry that there is still so much growth. We've, I, you know, I've been doing this professionally since 2006. And before that, I was in TV news. And I haven't been, I, I still think I, I haven't been as excited about the future of podcasting as I was on the first podcast that I sat down to host. Um, we are still at, at a time when people are exploring new media in an incredibly new, uh, noisy ecosystem. And yes, that means there's competition for Signal, but it really also means that uh, you stand a chance to create something great that a small and, and important audience discovers. And we were not able to do that in the TV news business. It just wasn't possible at the time. And so podcasting, I think, is full of unique opportunity and a lot of people who still haven't ever tried it. 
Uh, so I'm excited about it. Other uh, information from the Infinite Dial survey, 59% of those under 35 listen to podcasts at least once a month, and 55% under 54 listen to podcasts at least once per month. So uh, almost 60% of people in an important demographic under 35 are yeah. listening, and over half of those surveyed under 54, I hate to tell you this, Andy, that's us, uh, listen to podcasts at least <laughs> once per month. Although I think our podcast habits are, might be outliers, personally. Right, right, right. Yeah, well, they didn't pull me. <laughs> that's right. They didn't pull, <laughs> pull you. Uh, smart speaker ownership. Uh, so we're talking about uh, uh, HomePods and Alexas uh, may have peaked Slightly fewer, 34% report owning a smart speaker than the year before. However, nearly half of those who do own smart speakers says they say they own three or more of them. Do you own any smart speakers? We do. We do have, um, you know, the Apple HomePod that uh, you know is quite handy. Although, interestingly, we I, I don't listen to podcasts with it, but uh, I think music gets played on it more than podcast. I think that is that's the observation I was curious about. And and part of it is allows us to transition into our featured thesis of the day. Apple sucks at stuff sometimes. Um, <laughs> in this case, the HomePods, I, I think as speakers are incredible. I love them. And we have several of them. And I also mostly listen to my podcasts either on my AirPods or on the speaker on the phone. And yeah. Some of that is because I use a podcast app that isn't Apple Podcasts. If I used Apple Podcasts, I could tell my speaker to just play the latest episode of whatever in my library. But I use a different app. And so I have to airplay it to the smart speakers. And that is a cumbersome thing. And the speakers on the phone are actually pretty darn good. So for podcasting, I think that's interesting. Um, and I don't think anybody, Apple, uh, this is a sign of Apple's insistence on control that limits what developers are able to do with this with the speaker and and the speaker's been around a long time now and apple has been a recalcitrant you know teen in this space not giving up control allowing developers to do what they need to do to make that a better experience and on the heels of feeling crappy about that uh we get the <laughs> note from patreon uh about the latest news yeah about patreon how would you like to break this down well, I think the idea is, you know, a lot of these, uh, a lot of apps have to integrate different iOS technologies into their, into how they work. And what Apple is now doing is that uh, you're going to, basically, you're, it's going to cost more if you're going to um, want to use Patreon through, uh, subscribe through Apple. Uh, they're requiring that Patreon switch to their iOS in-app purchasing system. In November this year, and or they're going to just pull the Patreon app from the Apple Store or from the App Store, and so in in other words, it's going to cost more to do business with Apple for Patreon, and so that means that either as somebody who uses Patreon, you can you have the choice you can either uh, maintain your earnings and cover Apple's fees by increasing your price when people subscribe through your iOS app. Or you're given the op option to keep the price the same and that you eat that fee yourself. And, you know, I don't know. It is it is one of those things where it's like, I feel like this is the sort of thing that, you know, in the in the early days, like we would see these antitrust suits mm -hmm. where uh, these companies are, are fully operating in the world of monopoly and they're not being restricted enough. I am a massive Apple fan. And never has it been more clear about uh, to me than this kind of stuff that I am a fan of Apple's of certain business units and not others. I think yeah. this part of Apple represents the worst of Apple. So just a, a little bit more background, like the when a developer offers in-app purchases or purchases in the App Store, they're required to give Apple 30 percent of their uh, of the proceeds. And initially, when the app store opened... 30%. Just yeah. say that again. 30%. 30%. Yeah. 30%. Now, when the app store opened, 
people thought that was a lot. Developers thought that was a lot. But Apple made the case saying, look, we're building this app store. It's going to be a massive source of, of new uh, income for you as a developer. It's going to, we're going to take care of all the infrastructure. You're not going to have to pay for hosting your apps, for download traffic. We're just going to take care of that. And we think 30% is a fair um, fee for that, for, for taking off the, your uh, your plate, the fees that you would pay yourself. As a result, though, do you think do you, do you think Home Depot says that to to people who are selling their products there? Like, we're going to put it in our store, in our store, on our shelves. Like, I, honestly, I don't know. Like, I'm just curious. Like, does that seem reasonable in the scope of other businesses that would do essentially the same thing? Like, you don't have to pay all these other fees. We're going to put it on our shelves. We're going to take thirty percent, and you don't have to cover any of that yeah. other stuff. Yeah, I mean. It's an interesting model. I think this is uh, largely, I mean, there are, you know, pay to play fees. There are fees that, for example, as a seller in Amazon, that I take a, a cut from off of the top for certain services that Amazon offers, for example. So, it's, you know, it is a, it's a, it's kind of a known thing. Apple was trying to just be very clean about it early on and 30% was just a flat rate. Since then, they have they've changed the rates if you are a uh, I think there are some uh, twists. I'm not a developer. I don't pay a lot of attention to the changing rules, but I think that after you are a developer for over a year in the store, you go down to 15%. Uh, there's there's a new small business class where if you don't have a certain number of downloads, you pay less. Um, uh, but Patreon, back to our central point, was never saddled with this ten, with this uh, 30% fee. Be and I think it's because they sort of were forgotten because Patreon's model is different, right? Patreon's model yeah. is built off of our fans, right? Fans that come to us through Patreon, but they're not fans that Patreon found. They're not fans that Apple found. They're fans that we found, right? So right, Apple, right. It, essentially what has happened here is Apple woke up and said, wait a minute, our uh, our services revenue has ignored Patreon for over 10 years. But really, Patreon, the iOS app, lives on our iOS app store and should be in, we should enforce the same standards that we enforce on every other app. We're just trying to be consistent, right, in the application of rules. And it does not work for Patreon. Everybody sees it. But Apple, today's Apple, is under regulatory scrutiny around the world. And part of that scrutiny is consistency of applications of stated documented rules. And I think that's where this is coming from. Apple has no share in finding our clients that come to us by way of Patreon. That is 100% us. And yet Apple is coming to Patreon and saying, you're a giant app and collectively you make a lot of money uh, and you need to pay that 30%. So they want 30% on the tops of, of money that they did not, they did nothing, nothing to contribute to that transaction. And that's the part that's so frustrating. Apple wants money for nothing in this in this scenario. So there is a third option, like you laid out two options. And I just want to say one that's really important, which is the one we're going to be using on our Patreon accounts, which is stop using the iOS app, delete it from your phone, <laughs> because it's only these. And I think some of the news gets gets, you know, mucked up by this particular bit of nuance. We, the creators are not beholden to Apple's anti-steering rules. There are some rules in place in some places around the world that say you cannot, if you have an app in the App Store, you cannot tell people that you can go subscribe to the uh, uh, to your patron to your patronage uh, outside of the Apple App Store. We're not burdened by that, and you can be sure as hell we're going to tell people delete the Patreon app from your phone and use the web. Save it as a little app icon on your phone. The web is open. There is nothing on iOS that will cost you more by signing up on the website, patreon.com slash whatever your favorite creator is. This entire thing goes away if you just sign up on the web. 
this is an App Store thing. It is Apple's worst side. It is profiteering and profit-seeking at its very worst. It should be regulated, but we can ignore it completely if you just use the open web. There, that's my rant. Well, and I think it's smart. And I don't know, like, because there's there are free apps. There are apps that you purchase. In my mind, I guess it makes sense. Like if I'm going to purchase an app uh, and I'm going to purchase it through the app store and it's $9.99 or whatever, that, that okay, Apple, I, I can see them getting a percentage of that. But if it's a free app that I'm, I'm using for a subscription or uh, maybe it's a game and there are in-app purchases, things like that, that suddenly Apple, Apple is also getting 30% of all of that sort of stuff too, then it, it just feels uh, like they're operating in a different place that doesn't necessarily feel like as fair. And that's, I think, this this falls right into that. It's very frustrating. Yeah, no, it it really, really does. Um, I'm, I'm looking, I didn't have this up and handy. Uh, give me a second. Okay. So, uh, Jason Snell wrote an article for Macworld, um, you know, and, and Jason does a, a lot of great, great work in the Apple uh, ecosystem um, journalism and has been watching what has happened to Apple in the last 12 years of services revenue, right? How much revenue does Apple get off of what they call services? And that includes iCloud. It includes, you know, the TV. It includes uh, everything that they do that isn't a, a, a hard hardware product, and that includes the App Store. And when you look at where they started, which was right around, I don't know, three billion in services uh, to where they are now just 12 years later in their most recent quarter, uh, just over $24 billion in services, that has become, a, that services revenue has become a massive business in and of itself. And so you can kind of feel while why the interests, the executive interests at Apple who are beholden to shareholder value and are constantly fighting that tension um, are fighting less for things like this. And in the scope of $24 billion, uh, where it stands in terms of, of their quarterly services revenue, like that's obscene. And Patreon's contribution to that will be trivial. And it makes this feel so much worse as a result. So much worse as a creator. Like, I haven't felt uh, like as, as anti-Apple, this part of Apple, ever, right? I hate this side of Apple. And I am a massive fan of Apple products. Two things can be true. Well, I think a lot of this, I mean, it was not even with it was sometime in the past year when we were in a, a seminar with Apple talking about their new podcast subscriptions and mm -hmm. how they now have this way where you can subscribe very easily to make it incredibly easy to subscribe. It's right there in the app. You can subscribe. You can try it for free. Uh, as as users, it gives us the option to set up these trials and all of this sort of stuff like, you know, free first month and then this much per month or this much per year after your trial. It They make it very easy. And it kind of reeks as, uh, again, going back to that acting like a monopoly and just the antitrust way of operating that shortly after putting this in place where they came up with this way to very easily use Apple podcast subscriptions to then attack Patreon in yeah. this way. Yeah, that boy, what a great connection. That makes it even the more disgusting that that this has happened yeah, right. because they are going for yeah. The people, like when you look at the aesthetic of Apple, we love to be to make your products and we exist at the intersection of uh, liberal arts and uh, technology. And we're just really, we're really great. We're a bunch of hippies and we make great technology <laughs> because we want you to create great things. And then in the last year, they create an ad that uh, for the new iPad that consists of putting beloved instruments uh, and create uh, and tools that creators use to make great things and they put them in like a 30 ton press and destroy them in glorious glorious aesthetic detail and creator and and when the press lifts up now they have an iPad 
that sends such an obscene message to creators. <laughs> then they do, uh, you know, they have the this the uh, Patreon thing. Then they have the, like, it's just one thing after another. And don't forget what's going on in the uh, EU, the regulation of the EU. They are, like, Apple is just one after another, just own goaling their way through 2024. And I, I, I cannot stress how bad this makes this part of their business look from a company that was yeah. central to creators everywhere to a company that looks like they wholly disrespect those same people. Um, now, is am I going to start using a Windows machine? <laughs> no, that's going to take a lot more than this. Um, but I, I'll tell you, it, it doesn't feel good to, to have such revulsion for what they are doing to... To well, the people who are the backbone of what makes Apple great. Yeah. Well, and to your point, that it's these different divisions within the company. And that's what's frustrating because there are good sides and bad sides. And this is, again, you know, I, not wanting to get too political, but like the whole idea of like the antitrust suits and like breaking up these monopolies is to look at a situation like this and say, maybe you should be split up into, okay, there's this Apple company that's designing all this great stuff. And then there's this company that's just dealing with this, the app store and things like that, and then get it regulated and figure it out, but do something. So it's, you know, you can love Apple without having to hate Apple too. Yeah. Uh, uh, the same thing can be said of Google right now. Right. Like Google is oh, yeah. in a very precarious situation and uh, with their uh, search revenue and was just <laughs> here's another here's another interesting thing that you tied tied together with these pieces. Right. So Google, it was just um, uh, it was just told that it's you know, it's illegal for you to buy your placement as the default search engine on iOS. <laughs> now, did Apple do anything? To you know, does Apple it, is Apple doing anything illegal? No, they're not doing anything illegal, but they are certainly impacted by that because suddenly, what went from uh, a twenty billion dollar check that Apple got from Google to be that default search engine is going to zero, and that yeah. matters. So this whole services identity for Apple is a business that's trying to find itself and trying to find the sort of um, ethical path in the giant shadow of shareholder value. And I, I don't know if they can do it. I don't know if they can do it as a part of Apple. I would not want to be Tim Cook in this era right now. Yeah, it's a tricky spot. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I don't know. I always think that a smart business person will be able to find the way through. And I, sometimes I think, unfortunately, shareholder interests keep them from actually getting that done. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, there was a while where I had a fantasy that because Apple spends a lot of money on buy, share buybacks, and I had this fantasy that they were going to try and go private again. Uh, that hasn't happened, and it's it's no. sad. Uh, but yeah. people are making a lot of money off of it. That's the rant on Apple. Again, for podcasters, for creators on Patreon, please like this doesn't have to be a hair on fire moment for you. The message is please delete the Patreon app from your phone and use the web. Yeah. Because if you are not right. tempted, you can even use the Patreon app on your phone, but encourage your followers, if new followers, please sign up on the website. That's the change in your positioning. That's a change in your marketing. Tell people to use the website and you don't even have to single out iOS. You can just say the best sign-on experience is on the website. Please use the website. You'll pay the fairest rates and then you can use whatever platform you want and not even think about it anymore. Is that fair? Absolutely. All right. yeah, I think that's great. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for hanging out and listening to us rant about this uh, uh, generally horrible economic news <laughs> and profiteering <laughs> in the podcasting business. We're all okay. We're fine. We're all fine here. We're all fine. And there are more of us to enjoy. Absolutely. Uh, on behalf of Andy Delson, I'm Pete Wright, and we'll see you next time right here on the Podcast Podcast, a podcast about podcasting from True Story FM. Mm -hmm.